Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number 149, How Pleasure Refutes Free Will. It's uh, December 26th, the day after Christmas, 2013. Okay, and, you know, as I do with every episode before I get into the basic theme of the show, I just want to just go over what we generally mean when we say we have a free will and why this topic is important, you know, that, that we overcome this illusion. All right. Essentially, when we say we have a free will, we're saying that, like, what we decide is up to us. You know, nothing that's not in our control, like our unconscious, like, well, like the process of causality, like, you know, anything, nothing that's not in our control is making us, is compelling us to, to do what we do or think what we think or say what we say. You know, that's the idea of free will. Now, um, as I've explained in, in 148 previous shows, like, it, it's pretty impossible because, you know, everything has a cause, and if everything has a cause, everything that we decide, think, say, do has a cause, and there's a cause to that cause, and so what happens is this cause and effect chain, this, this ensuing regression, you know, causal regression, just goes back to before we were born, before the planet was created. That's the most simple way to, of un understanding um, why we don't have free will. But the, the theme of the, today's show is like, because like, I think, I think like understanding the concept of human will, you know, exploring free will within the context of pleasure might make it easier to understand why we don't have it for some people. Okay, um, so that's the basic definition. Another definition that I've just started using is it's what I call the puppet test. In other words, like, because what happens is like some philosophers, some less less scientists, but mainly philosophers, they don't like the idea that we don't have a free will, that nothing's up to us. So what they do is they, they redefine the term free will. Um, they've been doing this since Kant. Kant did this, uh, I think Hegel did, or Hume did this. You know, they'll just say, well, no, free will isn't what, what Spinoza and previous um, philosophers were disputing, you know, you know, they, they, all right, the way they define it is free will is having the will we want to have or something like that. So like the, the value of this puppet test is that like, so essentially, regardless of how you want to define free will, we have no more free will than would a puppet, than does a puppet. Okay. So that's so like, that covers any kind of a, you know, definition of free will that you might have. We just don't have it. Okay. All right. So, um, and the importance of this is because like, you know, I mean, like <laughs> the world is completely deluded about who we are as human beings, who we are as a humanity, you know, how the world works. Cause this, this just doesn't apply to human beings. It, it applies to everything. I mean, like every, everything that happens, every bird that flies, every, you know, rock that, <laughs> that falls or whatever, you know, every raindrop that falls and all. Everything is predetermined. It's like a, a movie playing out. You know, it's like, yeah. All right. And so, like, the idea is, like, to the extent we understand the free will is an illusion, we stop blaming ourselves and each other for things that aren't up to us. And it creates a much more compassionate and pleasant world. All right. That's it. So, so let's go with um, the first, first explanation of how pleasure refutes free will is... Um, we, we simply have to ask ourselves, can we freely choose pleasant thoughts? Because, you know, I mean, here's the, the, the idea behind this is like, we're hardwired. <laughs> we're hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. That's what we do. That's what all living organisms do, okay? We, you know, if it's too hot, we try to get into the shade. If it's too cold, we try to get into the sun. If we're hungry, we eat, you know. If we're tired, we sleep. Whatever it is, you know, we're always seeking pleasure, avoiding pain. It's not all that simple because sometimes we will endure a certain amount of pain in order to reap greater overall benefits in the future. Like we'll go through, like we'll exercise a lot. We'll go to the gym. We'll run, you know, just like we'll get in, in shape. And sometimes that's painful to a certain, certain extent. But what happens is that's an investment in greater pleasure, right? So it, it does you know, fulfill this pleasure principle. It's not like we're going against it. All right, so, so the idea is, um, you know, can we, 
can we choose to feel pleasure at will? If we had a free will, we could say, well, all right, I want to feel as much, I want to feel completely blissed out, totally, you know, happy, totally, you know, blissed out. And if we had a free will, we'd be able to do that. Okay, that's the idea behind this, this first refutation. Now, some, some people might say, some people might say, well, you know, all right, fine, we don't have complete free will, but we've got some free will. In other words, we can't, like, all the time, you know, choose to feel completely pleasant thoughts, but sometimes we can, okay? Now, I've, I've refuted this kind of argument on other shows. It's kind of like the partial free will argument. So in this sense, so all right, so like we can only choose to feel pleasant feelings part of the time. Let's assume that was correct. But then the question that that raises is like, all right, well, can we choose when we're going to choose the, uh, the pleasant feelings or not? Because like sometimes, you know, we're, we're, we're conceding with this that we can't choose the pleasant feelings all the time. So, it, so we're left with, yeah, sometimes we can choose it, but if we can't choose when we're choosing the pleasant feelings, obviously, you know, it's not a free will. You know, it's like we're being compelled by this window that, that and, and even so, that just invites the opportunity because then we have to want to and, all right. So, you know, the basic refutation is that if, if we had a free will, we would all be blissed out because that's really what we want, okay? Um, Let's see. Um, so yeah, we you know we wouldn't and because the idea is like you know because we're hedonic creatures, we're pleasure seeking. You know what happens is like these thoughts, these thoughts that are unpleasant sometimes will just come into our minds and they're uninvited. You know, think about it. If we had a free will, we'd just decide. Well, I'm not going to let any unpleasant thought into my mind. If I don't have unpleasant thoughts, that's not going to lead to unpleasant feelings. That, that happens in, like, in psychology. The idea is like, you know, our, our emotions, our feelings are related to our thoughts, you know, to a great extent. So the idea, all right, so like, again, if we had a free will, we would choose to, to feel, the kind, to think the kinds of thoughts that would just result in pleasant feelings. So obviously we can't do that. Okay, um, so the, the next way that free will is refuted by pleasure is like is the more basic principle that I alluded to, to before, the pleasure principle, or what I refer to as the hedonic principle. That's the idea that, you know, we're always seeking pleasure and we're, you know, and seeking to avoid pain. Okay? And and this is hardwired in us. To to get an idea of what it means that it's hardwired to, in us to do this. So we can't but do this. It's in our genes, it's in our biology, it's in our basic physiology, our unconscious physiology. Imagine, let's say you were like a, an engineer, a computer engineer, or a mechanical engineer, or whatever. So you, you create this robot, right? And you program the pro robot that every time, you know, this moves on wheels or something, right? And it can kind of like move wherever it wants, you know, according to how you program it, because that's the thing. Um, but like, so you program it that like, whenever it reaches an obstacle like a wall, it's going to make a left turn, okay? It's always going to do that because you're programming it that way, okay? Now, understand that with this analogy, the left turn is analogous um, to our always seeking pleasure. So just like we're hardwired to always seek pleasure, this robot is going to be always when it reaches an obstacle making a left turn. All right, so then like something we ask ourselves, is, is that robot choosing on its own, you know, of a free will or whatever, to make that left turn or must it make that left turn because it's hardwired, it's programmed to do that? And obviously it's the second case. I mean, like it can't help but do that because that's the way the robot has been programmed, hardwired, you know. And that's the same with us. Like we are hardwired to seek pleasure, avoid pain. We can't do that. We have a, view, a few other imperatives, like for example, let's say we want to empty like some liquid into two glasses, okay? And we, note, we see the size of the glasses and we notice one of them is clearly too small to, um, to be able to fit the, the liquid we want to you know, pour into it. So naturally, we would pour it into the one that's larger. So that's, that's what we refer to as our reason imperative, okay? And I think we're hardwired for that too. We're going to do what seems most reasonable to us, okay? Sometimes there's an exception to that. Sometimes our emotions 
kick in and say, well, you know, I know this seems most reasonable, but I've got this gut feeling that tells me that I should do something else. All right, sometimes that happens, but then you got to remember, when that happens, it's like a gut feeling. It's like an intuition, and we don't know where it comes from. It's like, you know, it's an emotion, okay? So, yeah, sometimes our emotions override our reason, but, again, that wouldn't give us a free will because, like, we are not in control of where these emotions arise or why they arise, in a sense. All right. Um, so, all right, so that's, you know, that's, those are the, the two basic ways that, that um, pleasure refutes free will. First, if we had a free will, nobody on the planet would be choosing negative thoughts or feelings, okay? We'd all be extremely happy. And like, I know this isn't the case because I've, I've researched happiness, you know? Like, my last show before this was on happiness. And like, here in the United States, the average level of happiness is about 70% meaning some people are much less happier than that. Um, even the happiest people who are like 80% or, or happier, they're only happy 50% of the time. You know, so like even, even the happiest people aren't happy all the time. Um, the happiest people incidentally are, are unhappy, let's say 20% of the time, which isn't bad, you know, but then, or not 30% of the time. And there's about 20% of the time that even the happiest people, people in general, are neither happy nor unhappy. I think we're just kind of like immersed in activity. We're not thinking about it, whatever. All right, so the idea is like, so yeah, so, you know, we're clearly not as happy as we would want to be. And then think of our, our society, our materialistic society, products, you know, things and stuff. We're always thinking, all right, if I get this, if I do this, if I, you know, get this job, if I, you know, make this money, if I, you know, hang out with these people, whatever it is, we're always, you know, seeking greater pleasure because we're not, we're, 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 we're um, cognizant of the fact that we're not as happy as we would like to be, okay? Um, in general, I mean, some people are like, sad. some people hopefully are not like completely happy, but they're satisfied with their level of happiness, right? But still, we're always trying to increase it. And again, the point is that if we had a free will, we could just like, all right, you know, I want to be blissed out every moment of every, t every day, and that would happen. Okay, so like, and, and again, or this, the second reason is this hardwired. We're hardwired. We can't but seek pleasure and um, avoid pain. You know, we can't will ourselves freely to, to you kind of like undo or escape or evade this, this hardwired biology in us, this, you know, okay, th these genetics. All right, so now here's the thing. So let's get back to like why the show is important relative to this topic of pleasure. Again, uh, we don't have a free will, but that doesn't mean that by learning certain things like the fact that we don't have a free will, we can't enhance our pleasure. That doesn't mean that we can't become happier. It simply means that to the extent we do, we're lucky. Like the universe or whatever is like controlling everything is allowing us to do that. But, you know, that, the way it works is, yeah, we learn something, we apply it, and we can expect some results. So, so according to, to that kind of like understanding, you know, which we've all experienced, the idea is like that, that one of the problems, one of the biggest problems with the illusion of free will is it personalizes everything. Everything becomes personal. We, you know, everybody acknowledges that we're like far from perfect human beings. I mean, we make mistakes all the time. I mean, you know, sometimes small mistakes, sometimes big mistakes, but we're, 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 we're not infallible. We, we make mistakes. And the problem with the free will illusion is that when, for example, other people make mistakes, let's say other people hurt us, other people do things we perceive as wrong, sometimes very wrong, whatever, you know, we will, we will blame them. We will say, all right, you of your own free will did this, you know, nothing was making you do it, no, nobody was making you do it, you did it, and because you did it, that makes you a, a, an evil person, and that justifies my hating you, and, and just, you know, it just, it creates a lot of negativity, and the thing is, it's a lot of unnecessary negativity, okay? That's the idea, it's like, we blame... When we, when we blame others and we hate others and stuff, that creates, you know, that's not very pleasant for us either. I mean, some, some of us enjoy that feeling, but I don't think it's a very healthy feeling to enjoy, even so. All right, so that's one part. So, like, you know, to the extent that we understood that nobody has a free will, it's not like we're going to let everybody off the hook. Um, I better explain this. All right, like, so we're fine. We don't have a free will. Psychology understands this. You know, not all psychologists do, but psychology as a science understands this. It understands that our behavior, human behavior, is the result of nature, you know, our genes, 
and nurture our environment, how we're raised. You know, there's no third component to that. It's nature and nurture, okay? There's, it's not nature, nurture, and free will. All right, so, so psychology, science understands this. Um, so, but but it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop there. Science, psychology also understands there, there's this thing called operant conditioning, okay? B.F. Skinner, basically the idea is that, like, if we want to mold let's say the behavior of our kids or our own behavior or the behavior of each other, definitely rewards and punishments work. In other words, like, so if, if we make a rule or a law that if you do certain things, then you're going to receive a punishment, that's going to serve as a deterrent, okay? You know, that's going to, you know, help people to, to, to not do that wrong thing. Conversely, if you, you, if you give a reward, you know, some kind of award or some money or whatever, some praise for doing something good or some other desired, some desired behavior, then that's going to induce people to want to do that. So, so I'm not saying that a reward and punishment isn't necessary or useful. I'm not saying that, that we would like abandon our laws and rules, you know, and civilization, you know, by abandoning free will, by overcoming it. I'm just saying like, the idea is that like, with this psychological principle of operant conditioning, you know, reward and punishment, it, you you don't you don't like let's say when you punish someone like to to an behavior you just punish or, or threaten punishment enough to prevent the behavior you don't add on to it like punishment because the person's evil because the, the person deserves it and all that you know because that's what that's the free will illusion the free will illusion just like arises or, or um, justifies the kind of hatred that that results in punitive you know a retributive punishment that it's it's designed to to not just um, not just you know prevent people from doing certain things not you know it's also designed to make the person who did whatever they did you know really suffer for something that was really not their fault to begin with so that that's the problem with that so in other words we can we can regulate our behavior and the behavior of society and all well enough probably much much better with um, without the free will illusion and actually this this isn't just my opinion in terms of much much better like what they found like in England and, and other countries like a few centuries ago there they had like these harsh laws I mean you steal something they cut off your hand and stuff I mean they were crazy really crazy so like you know or they'd imprison you for like you know 10 20 years for, the, for and so like what happened was um, they were afraid to like uh, lessen the penalty because they're afraid well if you lessen the penalty people will, um, will do more crime what they found is as they lessened the penalty, as they realized that these, these, these um, sentences, these punishments that are, they were doling out for, for relatively innocuous behavior, really, I mean, sometimes it was like religious, like if you said that God doesn't exist, they'd kill you. I mean, it's crazy. So, like, so the idea is like in a lot of countries like England and also in the United States, they began to reduce the, the punishments for various crimes. And what happened was crime declined when they did that. You know, it made, it made people feel better, right? It, people weren't living in fear. I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know the exact reasons of why the decline, but across the board, in a lot of countries that did this, crime, de cr crime, <laughs> crime declined when they, um, you know, lessened punishments. All right, so that, that kind of justifies this operant conditioning approach to, like, you know, molding behavior that, that doesn't at all rely on free will. Because again, in psychology, it doesn't matter whether you believe in free will or not. You're going to, you know, you're going to seek pleasure, avoid pain. You're going to go toward the rewards and avoid the punishments. Okay. Um, the other thing is like, you know, it's not just the behavior of other people we're trying to control. It's like our own feelings. Again, we, we want to feel good. We, you know, we're hardwired. That's, that's what we want to do. Sometimes we'll feel bad because, uh, well, you know, we say it's inevitable, why fight it and all? You know, that's, not, that's a mistake because, you know, to the extent we fight it, we succeed. But what happens is, all right, so naturally, we're, um, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. And to the extent we believe we have a free will, we will punish ourselves. I mean, this is something we're taught when we're really young. And it's kind of like a little necessary. You know, with young kids, you teach them, you know, you punish them when they do something they shouldn't, you know, so they learn. But a part of this punishment, unfortunately, is that, like, we teach kids to feel bad that, that they did, you know, wrong. And, you know, I'm not sure that's all that necessary. 
you know, because if you punish them, that should be enough. But, but idea is like, as adults, we internalize this. So like, we don't have, you know, parents anymore to punish us as adults. So like, well, we internalize this philosophy. And when we do wrong and we attribute free will to ourselves, we're blaming ourselves against something we did of our own free will, not that we were compelled, then we will punish ourselves for something that was absolutely not up to us. I mean, we couldn't, you know, the way the world works is whatever we might have done wrong, we spoke to somebody in, in an unkind way, we, we did something we shouldn't have done, whatever it is, it had to have happened. That's the thing. We couldn't have avoided it however we might have tried. Um, so that's, that's the reason. So like, you know, from that understanding, fine, we might like, let's say when we do things wrong, we might say to ourselves, all right, well, you know, I don't know why I did what was wrong before, you know, there's like there was an impulse or like maybe I thought it was right, whatever. But now I realize it was wrong. And that's our conscience. OK, that's our conscience talking to us, just like informing us what we should do in the future. Because a lot of times what happens is like when we do th uh, wrong as individuals, it's not just guilt. That, that, um, that we punish ourselves with, a lot of the results of wrong is that like it creates problems for other people, for the rest of the world, and a lot of times those problems come back to us. So, so the idea is like, so we have a conscience that makes us aware that we ha we've done something wrong. And in fact, I mean, this is something I, I read from a, a book on happiness years ago, uh, Zelig Pliskin, Gateway to Happiness. It's a good idea is like when, when, you, when you recognize that you've done something wrong and you understand you don't have a free will, not only should you not punish yourself, you know, you've recognized it, you should feel good that you recognized it because like you could feel good that in the future you're going to avoid it. It's more likely that you're going to avoid doing that same wrong because you recognize it's wrong and you should feel good about that. All right, so, um, so again, these are two, two just very clear ways how, that, um, that overcoming the illusion of free will can help us, you know, um, in our personal lives and societally. You know, when, when, we, when other people do things wrong, we don't blame them. Again, that doesn't mean we don't hold them or us accountable. We, we'd still do that, but with much less vindictiveness, retribution, you know, m with much less of the negativity. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just want to like, so what happens is like, so, you know, a lot of philosophers perplexingly, I mean, how can you, you know, the, the fact that we don't have a free will is as simple as the fact that everything has a cause. That is like, that is like elementary logic. And like, so like for PhD philosophers to either not understand this or understand this, but still nevertheless maintain that we have free will, it's beyond understanding okay you know because like you know the only the only way i can think that this happens is like that in our our educational system doesn't really teach us how to think it teaches us how to learn then how to remember what we've learned then how to recite what we've learned for tests and all and then how to implement what we've learned which is a which apparently is a, is a distinct a vastly distinct skill from just critical analysis logic you know just basic thinking so anyway, so like, all right, so, um, so a lot of these philosophers, they don't get it for whatever reason. You can't blame them, okay? <laughs> Got to remind yourself of that. You can't blame them, but see, a lot of times they're afraid that, well, you know, if we, if we overcome this illusion of free will, there will be no morality. You know, um, you can't hold anybody accountable. You know, civilization is going to collapse. They fear that, and that's, that's just like, that's a very unintelligent fear it's not thought out very well you know it's probably just emotional they, they really have couldn't have thought it out because if they did they would have reached a different conclusion because the idea is like we wouldn't let that happen you know as everybody understands and you know, nobody has a free will we would use that knowledge to create a better world because again we're still hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain so if people are doing things that are wrong we're not going to let them get away with it and same for us okay so like um Another thing it's going to do is like, you know, um, I start the shows, um, I used to start the shows with this quote by this uh, philosopher John Searle that um, he said for free will to be understood by the world to be an illusion would be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or 
Darwin or Galileo or Newton. I, I got that order wrong, but anyway, those are those five guys. It would be a bigger revolution in our thinking, okay, meaning in our consciousness. So, so yeah, it was great to understand that the, that the Earth revolves around the sun. It was great to understand that the Earth is an orb instead of flat, right? But those things don't really mean much. You know, E equals MC squared, fine, that's great, and that allows us to do a lot of stuff in physics, but it doesn't really affect our everyday life very much. This overcoming the illusion of free will would lead to a categorically brand new consciousness and um, it, would, it would create a brand new world. It, it, the world would be far more peaceful, far more compassionate, far more understanding, far more intelligent, okay? Because again, this, you know, to conclude that we have a free will is just like a, a profound lack of intelligence, lack of thinking. So it'd be great for everything. All right, I got about two minutes left. I'm going to do some commercials. All right, so um, first episode, I started doing this show um, November 2010, and so like the first 18 episodes, I think 17 now because I just decided to omit one of them, are, are published in a book, all right, uh, it's called Exploring Illusion of Free Will, and it's available through Amazon, it's like, um, actually, uh, the, the, the chap, that's, the second edition is out now, but the first edition is uh, available through my website, all right, so it's Exploring Illusion of Free Will, or CausalConsciousness.com, um, we got a couple of TV shows, this one that airs in White Plains every Wednesday at 7.30 and every Thursday at 9 p.m., 7.30 p.m. also. Okay, then we have a couple of meetups. The um, meetup I started April 7th, 2010 in Manhattan in the um, Sony building, Madison Avenue, 550 Madison between 5th and Madison on between 55th and 56th streets. Okay, that's the first Saturday of each month. And again, we got the website, and, and what I do is I upload all these episodes to YouTube. So if you want to see it again, I mean, you, you'll have to wait a while because sometimes it takes me a while to get to it. But eventually, I've, there's there's at least 140 up there already. Okay, so um, and and the last thing, the episodes are also available for free. You know, completely free. You can download them through iTunes as MP3s. Okay, you can put them into your MP3 player. You know, listen to them, share them. The, I put them in the public domain so you can share them. There's no like copyright restrictions restrictions on that. All right, so that is basically how pleasure refutes free will, and uh, I appreciate your watching, and um, so, you know, I'll, I'll continue to, to explore this. Not much longer, I think, because I want to get on to other things, but uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks.